Hello champions and welcome back to PW English and I am your Diksha ma'am. So today we are going to start with the chapter X3 T products and its elimination. So in this chapter there is one term that you need to know that is excretion. You have come across a term known as egestion in digest in digestive system chapter and now there is a term known as excretion. So what's the difference? The egestion is the removal of undigested food, the food that is not digested in your body. Whereas excretion is the removal of metabolic waste. What it is? It is the removal of metabolic waste. So egestion is the removal of undigested food. The food that is in your gut which does not get digested, it has to move out. And the digested one will get absorbed, right? Whereas excretion is removal of metabolic waste. So there are lot of metabolic reactions going on in your body. Right? So the food that is digested, now it has to get absorbed and get into your blood. And from, from blood it will go to tissues and tissue will do a lot of metabolic reaction. Now out of that metabolic reaction that is occurring in the cell, whatever waste is going to be produced, it will move out and move out through your other uh, organs of body like kidney and that process is known as excretion fine so what are the various excrety products that are produced so in various animals different types of excrety waste are formed right so in also in us there are different kind of excrety waste which are formed but we have one main excrety waste that come out from the body right so there are basically three types of excretory wa uh, waste one is ammonia one is ammonia Second is urea and third one is uric acid. Fine. So there are three types of excretion. So ammonia, ammonia is the one which is the most toxic waste and it is formed by deamination of amino acid. In amino acids, we have NH2 group. So when this NH2 group gets removed, it becomes ammonia. So ammonia is basically what? NH3 only, right? If I'm talking about iron, I'll put NH4 positive, right? So, ammonia is produced by deamination. D means removal. Amination means amine group of amino acid. This is the most toxic one. If some waste is so much toxic, it will be required a lot of water for its removal, right? So, if something is so much toxic, you need to dilute it. So, for its removal, we need a lot of water. So, this type of excretory waste is the main excretory waste of aquatic organism because they are already living in water. But terrestrial organism cannot afford this main excretory waste. Why? Because we do not have much water. So, this requires a large amount of water. for excretion so what organisms have this uh, ammonia as their excretory waste one we have invertebrates and invertebrates remove ammonia through diffusion through diffusion through their body surface so this will be moving out from uh, the body surface via diffusion then we have bony fishes in bony fishes, the gill epithelium will be removing this uh, particular waste. And then we have aquatic amphibians and arthropods. Aquatic amphibians and arthropods. Not all arthropods, the aquatic one like prawns. The bees, they are also arthropods but they are terrestrial. And whereas prawns, they are also arthropod, but they live in water. So, the excretory waste is ammonia. Fine. Next, we have urea. Urea is produced by the combination of ammonia and CO2 in our body in the liver. So, it is produced in liver. It is less toxic than ammonia. So, definitely it will require less water for its removal. So, if I am talking about the urea, what is its color? It is white in color and it is crystalline. 
white in color okay so it's removed through your body or through which organ through kidney so the urea is produced in the liver but who is helping in its removal in our body the kidney is helping in its removal so if i'm talking about urea what organisms have this main excretory product first of all we have human or the mammals better right mammals then aquatic amphibians have the ammonia as excretory waste because they are living in what they are living in water whereas frog and toad they have urea as their main excretory product now the frog have larva which is known as tadpole and that tadpole lives in water so its larva will be having ammonia as waste so larva will be having ammonia as waste okay because it is aquatic then cartilaginous fishes they also have urea as their excretory waste all right next we have uric acid it is the least toxic one and it leads it needs less amount of water at least it needs negligible amount of water for removal no amount of water for removal it's the least toxic one and it comes out in solid form in solid form so ammonia was formed by removal of nh2 from amino acid whereas urea was formed in liver by combination of ammonia and what uh, and co2 whereas uric acid is formed by the metabolism metabolism what nucleotide in nucleotides we have bases adenine and guanine so when an adenine and guanine are broken down they later form uric acid so formed by nucleic acid metabolism a nucleotide metabolism so what nucleotide which have adenine and guanine a and g fine so what organism has uric acid as the main excretory products we have cockroach do remember the question is asked from this point that cockroach have the uric acid as the main excretory product otherwise reptiles and birds so one thing in common of reptiles and birds is that they both are egg laying if you see and both uh, their eggs have shell on it yes the amphibians are also eggling the fishes are also eggling but their eggs do not have shell on it so all those organisms which have shelled egg they usually excrete uric acid why because uric acid is least toxic uric acid is least toxic okay so if i have this uh, egg here the embryo is growing and embryo is excreting ammonia will this egg will or this embryo will survive no because ammonia is uh, because ammonia is quite toxic right but if i say i have this egg and this embryo is growing here and the excretory product here is uric acid now the embryo can easily survive why because it is least toxic and embryo embryo will survive in this case but not in this case why because it is least toxic and it will not cause any toxicity and hence the embryo will not die so this is another reason why the organism which have shelled eggs which eggs shelled eggs the one which uh, the shells made up of calcium or calcium carbonate you also call them as cledoic eggs what do you call them as cledoic eggs they have they have this um, uh, uric acid as the main excretory product fine Okay, boys and girls. Let's see what type of various excretory organ the organisms have. Every organ of organism depends upon how complex the organism is. That means it has tissues, it has organs, or the organs are formed or not, or organs are forming system or not. Right. So these organs depend upon also at what habitat they are living. Right. So two factors. One is complexity of body and their habitat. they are so much important in deciding or in adaptation of their of their excretory organ right so first of all the very simple organs that we have protonephridia flame cell where do you find them you find them in platyhelminthes also known as flatworms example planaria so you have seen planaria right yes and also it is found in rotifers they are kind of nematodes they are a type of nematode nematelinthes annelids and cephalocordate example amphioxus what is the function of this organ 
This organ helps in osmoregulation. It's an excretory organ, but the major function of this organ is to maintain the fluid and or the water and ion balance. What is osmoregulation? The maintenance of the ion and water balance, the salt and water balance in the body. Right. Next, we have nephridia. These are tubular structures. They are present in earthworm and some other annelids. They remove nitrogen waste. And they also help in osmoregulation. So, this both function is excretion as well as osmoregulation. Malpigian tubules are found in insects like the bees, like the ants, like the cockroach. It's important. Okay. Removal of nitrogenous waste as well as osmoregulation. Antenal glands or green glands are found in the crustaceans like prawns. What are crustacean? These are the, uh, this is a class of arthropod. And they help in excretion. Then we have kidney in the vertebrates and this kidney helps in both excretion as well as osmoregulation. So, let's talk about how do they look like, these organs, right? So, as you can see this organism, this is a flatworm known as planaria. This planaria have cells known as flame cell or protonephridia, okay? Then you can see here, this is this dissection of cockroach. So, in cockroach, we have these yellow colored blind sac like structure. These are known as malpigian tubules. Here you can see this is a prawn's head. On a head of prawn, there is antenna. On antenna, we have these green colored gland known as green glands. Because they are present on antenna, you call them as antennal glands. And then we have these small structures known as nephridia in the earthworm. Okay. Then, let's talk about our system, the human excretory system. So, if I talk about human excretory system, what do we have? We have major excretory organs. So, some are, you say, more important. Another are less important in excretion or they are playing less role in excretion. Okay. So, uh, one type of organ is a primary, which is important one. And other organs are secondary organs. Other organs are secondary organs. Okay. So, if I talk about primary organ, what do we have? The kidney is a primary organ of excretion. And with kidney, there are certain other associated structure that we will be uh, studying about them in the later sections. Then we have the secondary ones. Then we have secondary one. What are these? For example, we have skin. We have salivary gland. We have lungs, we have liver and we have large intestine. So, these organs also play some role in excretion apart from kidney. Now, what do they excrete? Let's see. In skin, we have two types of gland. One are the sweat glands, the one that excretes sweat. Another are your oil glands. So, we have sweat gland and then we have oil gland. Okay. So, this sweat gland, it secretes sweat and that contains water, small amount of urea and lactic acid. Fine. Whereas, oil gland, they secrete fatty acids and waxes. On the other hand, salivary gland secretes saliva, but in saliva, we also have small amount of urea. So, yes, salivary glands also excrete very small amount of urea, okay. Then lungs, it excretes CO2, around 18, 18 liter of CO2 is excreted per hour and water. Fine. Then liver, liver excretes a lot of things. It excretes. Your toxins, bile, pigments, bile salt and even cholesterol. And large intestine, it excrete divalent ions. Divalent ions like calcium, magnesium. Okay. So, apart from the major organ that's kidney, there are also certain organs in your body that they are also helps in excretion. Though the amount is very less, that's why they are the secondary excretory organs, but they are playing some role in osmoregulation. Okay. 
all right so let's talk about the human main excretory system which involves kidney so you can see the system this is kidney so you have two kidneys as you can see one kidney is here another is there okay and kidney is innervated by blood vessel this is renal artery and then we have renal vein okay so this one is renal artery and this one is renal vein then from the kidney, it, there is coming out small tube-like structures, you call them as ureters. And that enters into this small pear-shaped structure known as urinary bladder, which open to the outside through this small structure known as urethra. So, as you can see, we have two ureters, we have two kidney, we have one urinary bladder and one urethra. Fine, so that's the overview. We'll be doing that in detail. Now let's start with let's start with the external structure of kidney. So if you have seen this diagram carefully, what was the color of kidney? What was the color? It was red in color. So if I talk about the color and shape, the shape is bean shape, like the rajma you eat. And it is reddish brown in color. reddish brown in color so let's make it in red color then so if this is your kidney what is its exact location its exact location is it is present between 12th thoracic vertebra i hope you all understand what is vertebra these are small bones in vertebral column and third lumbar vertebra that is, that is its exact location sometime they may give you the option last thoracic and third lumbar this is also correct why because thoracic vertebra total 12 only okay so the 12th thoracic or also they may ask you about or they will give you an option the last thoracic so do not get confused so the color is reddish brown and the shape is bean shape let's see, uh, talk about its dimension the length is 10 to 12 centimeter, width is 5 to 7, thickness is 2 to 3 and weight is around 120 to 170 gram of each kit. Okay, so how much it weigh? Around 120 to 170 grams. Alright, okay. So, if I talk about the peritoneum, so this type of organ is present outside your body cavity and hence you call it as a retroperitoneal organ. So, your kidney is a retroperitoneal organ. What is a retroperitoneal organ? So most of the organs, like if this is your body, body wall, most of the organs are present in a cavity, in a cavity known as peritoneum. So this is the outer layer of peritoneum, this is the inner layer of peritoneum and you can, you can easily see that these organs are present right here. These are peritoneal organs. But sometime, and this cavity is peritoneum, sometimes the organs are present outside it. Right? Sometimes the organs are present outside the uh, peritoneum and you call these organs as retroperitoneal organ. So, the organs present outside peritoneum. So, as a result, they will be having only peritoneum at one side but not on both the sides. So, you will see it will be having this peritoneum layer on one side only. Okay, so the peritoneum layer will be present at one side only and here will be present the abdominal wall. What will be present here? Here will be the abdominal wall or body wall because the kidney is present in the abdomen not in the thorax. So, this is the body wall. For example, if this is my abdomen, this side is a ventral side, this side is a dorsal side. My kidney will be directly attached to the dorsal body wall because it is present outside the abdomen. Okay, so this is a dorsal body wall dorsal abdominal wall so it is one at one side it is directly attached to abdominal wall and at one side what is present peritoneum is present now this small depression like structure through which the ureters comes out what you call this structure as this depression like structure this you call this structure as hilum and from hilum what comes out ureters come Okay, so hilum is this point fr uh, from where the ureters comes out. Also from here, the blood vessels enter and exit. So like renal artery and renal vein enters and exit from this point known as hilum. 
if i see what are the various layers or coatings on the kidney then what are these three coatings on kidney first of all if this is your kidney kidney will be having the outer this layer known as the renal capsule on it and then it will be having a layer of fat on it the adipose tissue and then the outermost covering known as renal fascia so there are three coatings on the kidney one the outermost one is renal fascia and renal fascia is the one that attaches the kidney with this wall that attaches the kidney with this wall and then this layer of fat known as adipose layer and this one renal capsule renal capsule and renal fascia both are made up of connective tissue both are made up of dense connective tissue whereas this renal fascia helps the kidney to attach to the dorsal wall and renal capsule renal capsule provides shape it provides shape then what is the function of this fat it will provide shock absorption it helps in protection okay so there are these three layers present on the kidney and kidney is a retroperitoneal organ that means it will be having peritoneum on one side only not on the other side other side the kidney will be directly attached to the abdominal or dorsal body wall okay all right let's talk about the internal structure of the kidney let's talk about internal structure of the kidney so you must all have seen this diagram yes or no yes or no i know you have seen this so if you see it carefully there are two regions in the kidney the inner region known as this one where my hand is known as medulla and this outer region which is like pink in color this one is your cortex so we say that we say that the internal structure of kidney is divided into two parts is divided into outer cortical region or cortex and inner medulla and inner medulla okay so the outer region is known as cortex and inner region is known as medulla so if you see inside the kidney there are pyramid shape like structure these are maximum up to 10 8 to 10 structure known as renal pyramids they are also known as renal pyramids or medullary pyramids and these contains the structural and functional unit of kidney known as nephrons what do they have they contain nephron fine then they open into these tubular structure let me highlight them for you these are known as calyces minor calyx what are these minor calyx so these are i am writing here minor calyx minor calyx or calyces calyces is plural calyx is singular okay so these open into this wide structure let me color it with another one this one this one is major calyx what is this this is major calyx this one is major calyx okay this major calyx will then open into this funnel shape area known as renal pelvis can you see this renal pelvis so if someone ask you what is the shape of renal pelvis you will say it is funnel shaped this funnel shape area so outer area is known as cortex inner is medulla in medulla we have these pyramids the pyramids are partly in the cortex and uh, only little part in the cortex mostly in the medulla then it opens into tube known as minor calyx minor calyx open into larger tube known as major calyx and all these major calyx open into this area known as renal pelvis and renal pelvis then open outside here in the hilum from where the blood vessels are coming and going out and ureter is also coming out okay so here you can see sometime the cortex is emerging inside can you see this areas where the cortex is emerging inside this area yes this cortex is emerging inside these area are known as columns renal columns i am shading it these areas these areas they are known as renal columns or columns of bertini renal columns or columns of bertini if someone ask you what are the renal columns or columns of bertini then what will you say you will say renal columns or columns of bertini are the extensions of cortex into the medulla these are extensions of cortex into the medulla so extension of cortex 
in medulla okay so that's the internal structure of your kidney guys let's move further and talk about the aha uh -huh, questions okay so your study is incomplete without questions i tell you the position of kidney in human is interperitoneal retroperitoneal intraperitoneal none of the above where it is present outside the outside the peritoneum but it is covered by one side retro means behind behind it doesn't have peritoneum so answer is 2 okay next columns of bertini in the kidney of mammals are formed as extension of medulla in cortex cortex in medulla medulla in pelvis pelvis in ureter so now you better know it has nothing to do with the pelvis so these two are already eliminated now let's talk about these so these are the pillars of cortex which are entering which area entering in the medulla so it's cortex in the medulla sir two next kidney are reddish brown bean shaped structure situated between last thoracic third lumbar third lumbar fifth lumbar seventh cervical and second thoracic fifth thoracic and last lumbar very simple last thoracic which is the 12th thoracic and third lumbar is the correct answer so there are certain things that you need to memorize okay or there is one more thing that will make it easier for you to memorize its location your 12th thoracic is attached with your last rib okay yes so here you can easily found find out the last two ribs the 11th rib and 12th rib so that becomes pretty clear that it starts from the 12th and it will end to the one or two or three lumbar okay all right okay so i think that's pretty clear to everyone now let's talk about the structure of nephron okay so nephron if i tell you it is the structural and functional unit of kidney it is the structural and functional unit of kidney so each kidney contains around 1 million nephron So let's see the structure of your nephron. So as you can see the structure, first of all, there is this structure known as Malpighian corpuscle or Malpighian body. From here to here, we have this structure known as Malpighian corpuscle. This Malpighian corpuscle contains two structures, as you can see here. First is this structure. is known as bowman's capsule which i'm highlighting this structure is known as bowman's capsule and in the bowman's capsule here there is entry of arteriole so the one which is entering the bowman's capsule is afferent arteriole afferent means towards and this has wider lumen than the upper one and upper one is the efferent arteriole these arteriole when it enters further in the bowman's capsule or towards better say towards the bowman's capsule they form a tuft of capillaries the uh, you can say the junction of capillaries and this structure is known as glomerulus glomerulus so glomerulus is nothing but it is a tuft of capillaries then we have this structure known as pct what is pct proximal convoluted tubule proximal means near because it is near to malpighian corpuscle so its name has proximal in it convoluted means wavy as you can see this is little wavy and tubule because it is tube like it's hollow inside then we have this structure this is known as loop of henle loop of henle has this portion known as descending loop of henle and this one ascending because the flow of the fluid here will be in this direction so as according to direction their name has been suggested so this is descending limb of loop of henle and this is ascending limb of loop of henle 
Then we have this again wavy structure known as DCT, distal convoluted tubule. This distal convoluted tubule will then open into this larger duct known as collecting duct. So, collecting duct is common for a number of nephron. Here, a lot of DCT will be coming from various nephrons. Okay. So, this is the structure of your nephron. So, this nephron is innervated by blood vessels. Okay. Because I have told you these are blood vessels. Now, what happen is, now what happen is, this blood vessel efferent one, which one efferent one? It will go down and it will form certain capillaries here and large limb vessels here. You call it as vasa recta. What you call it as vasa recta. So, efferent is coming down. It is also forming some capillaries. What do you call these capillaries? These are capillaries. What do you call these capillaries? These are peritubular capillaries. Okay. And also it is forming this structure which is known as vasa recta. One thing that you have are these capillaries. Another thing that you have is this structure, this one. This is known as, this is known as vasa recta which runs parallel to the loop of Henle. That runs parallel to the loop of Henle. Fine? Okay. Moving further to what are the various types of nephron we have? What are the various types of nephron we have? We have two types of nephron. One is cortical and another is juxtamedullary. Okay. So, as you can see in this picture, uh, two types of nephrons have been made. This one is cortical and this one is juxtamedullary. Okay. So, this one is mostly present in the cortex region. As you can see, this region is cortex. This region is medulla. So, as you can see the difference, first of all, the majority of nephrons are to have in your body, they are cortical around 85% and they are present in cortex area, whereas juxtamedullary are 15% present in juxtamedullary area. Now, what is a juxtamedullary area? It's that particular area which is present between the cortex and medulla. If I say this is your cortex, okay, this is cortex. Let's demarcate now clearly. If this is your cortex region, Upper one. This region is juxtamedullary. This region is medullary. Okay. So it will start from your juxtamedullary region. The size of cortical, as you can see, is shorter, whereas juxtamedullary, they go deep inside the medulla. So you call it as the juxtamedullary nephron. Then uh, they their size is longer. What size makes it longer? The uh, size of loop of Henle. Its loop of Henle is longer, its loop of Henle is shorter. Again, if it has better loop of Henle, it, if it has better loop of Henle and the blood vessel that runs parallel to the loop of Henle will also be there, right? So, it has vasa recta, but there the vasa recta is not present. It will only be having peritubular capillaries, but here both peritubular capillaries and vasa recta will be present. The cortical are major and they work in normal condition, whereas extramedullary function during water shortage condition. For example, you are drinking less water or you get dehydrated. At that time, the juxtamedullary nephron will function okay so uh, moving further to the next topic these were the types of nephron let's see how the urine is formed now the very important part of this chapter how the urine is formed let's talk about it so the urine formation takes place by three method one is glomerular filtration Second is your reabsorption. So, these are the processes, important processes of urine formation. And third is secretion. The glomerular filtration is also known as ultrafiltration. You also call it as ultrafiltration. Okay. So, let's talk about all these three processes in detail. So, we'll start with the glomerular filtration first. Okay, so the glomerular filtration, the glomerular filtration involves a very important structure known as filtration membrane. What is it? What does it involve? Filtration membrane. So before starting it, let's discuss what is a filtration membrane. 
This is your Bowman's capsule. And here comes your afferent arteriole which is bringing blood and here it is forming your glomerulus. Okay. In glomerulus, what do we have? In glomerulus, we have here capillaries and capillaries have simple squamous epithelium. Yes, it has simple squamous epithelium. Then, Bowman's capsule also have simple squamous epithelium here. It also have simple squamous it also have simple squamous epithelium. All right. Apart from these simple squamous epithelial cell, this Bowman's capsule have some special cells here known as podocytes. Podocytes, they appear like feet. So, that's why the name is podocyte. Okay, like this. It, it's, it appears just like feet, right? <laughs> okay. So, these three layers along with its basement membrane. So, this is how it becomes three layers, okay, because there will definitely be a basement membrane between the two. This forms your filtration membrane. This three layers, it is your filtration membrane, okay. What is your filtration membrane? First of all, what it is made up of? Your filtration membrane is made up of, firstly, the squamous cells or the endothelium, endothelium of capillary. What is endothelium? The simple squamous of blood vessel is known as endothelium. Then the basement membrane in them and here the cells of Bowman's capsule which are podocytes. Podocytes along with these cells which are simple squamous and simple squamous. Okay, so these three layers are forming filtration membrane. What's the uh, function of filtration membrane? Here we have blood. The blood needs to get filtered and move down here in the Bowman's capsule's lumen. And hence it is going to become a fluid that will later on, that will later on will become your, become your urine. And here you will not call it as urine because it has just filtered. And so how or so and so we will call it as a filtrate, not the urine. Okay. So, blood here will get filtered. It has to pass through this. The blood will pass through this and it will become a fluid known as filtrate. Okay. So, as you can see, the podocytes have certain depressions here or the gaps here. Okay. So, these gaps here, they are known as filtration slits. What do you call it as? Filtrations. Okay. So, the blood first of all has to pass through the simple squamous of blood vessel. For example, if this is a blood vessel, it has simple squamous all around. The blood will pass through the simple squamous cell and now there are podocytes and it will uh, move out through these filtration slits of the podocyte and then it will enter into the lumen of Bowman's capsule and hence now it will be known as a filtrate. So, this process is known as filtration. Since the filtration is so much fine that it is passing through something, a lot of things will not be allowed Okay, a lot of things will not be allowed. For example, the large protein molecules cannot pass through it, so they will not be allowed. Hence, this filtration is known as ultra filtration because it is so much finely filtered. So that's why you call it as ultra filtration. Fine. Okay. Moving further to the next. So the filtration that is taking place across the filtration membrane does it does it happen like this only? Does it need any force? Yes, it do needs pressures. So, uh, the pressures are different at this point. Okay, one is a pressure of blood that is flowing on the uh, Bowman's capsule or the blood pressure that is coming in the glomerulus. Okay, one pressure is this. If this is your Bowman's capsule, this is a Bowman's capsule, there is blood that is coming from the efferent efferent arteriole and here is glomerulus. Okay, so one is a pressure that has been exerted here which is glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So, this pressure is glomerular hydrostatic pressure. So, glomerular hydrostatic pressure is a type of a positive pressure that will, that will help in more filtration. So, this is a positive pressure that will help in the filtration. Okay. Its value is around 60 mm of mercury. So, more the blood pressure, more the glomerular hydrostatic pressure, more will be the filtration. But again, there is always someone when you are doing good deed, someone will always put a resistance. Okay. 
so there are two other pressure which are putting some resistance one is a blood colloid osmotic pressure bcop blood colloid osmotic pressure this is a negative pressure exerted by the proteins exerted by the protein molecules in the blood these protein molecules will block the filtration membrane and hence they will resist the filtration so this pressure is going to occur in the opposite direction like this so this type of a pressure is blood colloid osmotic pressure its value is around 32 mm of mercury and it is a negative pressure so why this pressure is occurring this is occurring due to colloidal particles colloidal particles in the blood okay another when a lot of filtration is taking place the time will come when this capsule will fill bowman's capsule will fill again the pressure will be in opposite direction preventing the resistance like when you are uh, you know uh, filtering something like a laminate or lemon water with the help of sieve or you are filtering the uh, tea at home so when the glass get full the filtration stops and the reverse start to happen that means that sieve the tea start to get collect this is what happened the same is happening here when this gets so much full it will start resisting the filtration process and this negative pressure is your capsular hydrostatic pressure capsular hydrostatic this is due to the opposite pressure of the filtrate of a bowman's capsule it is also negative so when you sum up everything you will get that there is a net filtration pressure of around 10 mm of mercury this is 10 to 20 mm of mercury basically and varies from person to person and its uh, condition and its whatever the person eats in day to day life fine so net filtration pressure is the pressure we required for filtration pressure required for filtration so whenever the uh, blood pressure increases the ghp will increase and hence the filtration will increase now let's discuss this uh, reabsorption secretion and filtration in deep so what things cannot pass if someone asks you what things that cannot pass through your uh, filtration membrane these are large size protein that cannot pass through the membrane pores that will not be allowed there okay all right moving further to what the reabsorption is so now what we have done here is we have done the filtration this was bowman's capsule this is pct okay so the blood from uh, this bowman's capsule or uh, the glomerulus it will passing through the filtration membrane and it will it will enter here and it will become a filtrate it will become a filtrate so this process is known as filtration so after filtration the whatever filtrate is formed it has to pass through these tubes now there are certain things that are very much important to you for example glucose amino acid okay and most important water most important water because here because here the amount of filtrate formed per day is around 180 liter right but the urine form is around 1.5 liter per day okay if i say if i say whatever blood is coming here per minute is 1 by 5 of the cardiac output whatever blood is coming here is 1 by 5 of the cardiac output around 1200 ml per minute blood is coming here okay but out of this how much filtrate is formed 180 liter per day filtrate is formed 180 liter per day filtrate is formed and you call it as glomerular filtration rate what do you call it as glomerular filtration rate okay that means the rate at which the glomerular is filtering but the urine formed is 1.5 but you have produced 180 liter but why are you not excreting 180 liter because there are certain things that you need to save like water so most of the things in these tubules they are given back to blood vessels they are given back to blood vessel and this process is known as reabsorption this process is known as reabsorption you got it because 
बिकॉज वी वॉन्ट टू कंजर्व थिंग्स एयर द अमाउंट ऑफ ब्लड दैट वॉज कमिंग पर मिनट वॉज बारह सो एम एल पर मिनट अगेन आई एम स्पीकिंग इन आई थिंक हिंदी वन थाउजेंड टू हंड्रेड एम एल पर मिनट विच इज अराउंड वन बाई फाइव ऑफ अ कार्डिक आउटपुट बट हाउ मच इज गेटिंग फिल्टर्ड हाउ मच इज गेटिंग फिल्टर वन एटी लीटर पर डे वन एटी लीटर पर डे बट यू आर एक्सक्रीटिंग वी आर एक्सक्रीटिंग द यूरिन फॉर्म इज अराउंड वन पॉइंट फाइव लीटर पर डे so where 99% has gone the 99% has been taken out taken back from these tubule to the blood so i told you that there are blood capillaries around these tubule yes so this everything which is getting uh, back will now it will enter into your blood it will enter into your blood okay so this process is known as reabsorption now there is a third thing known as secretion so there are certain things in your body there are certain things in your body which are harmful to you which are harmful to you like h positive ions potassium ions if they get so much in your fluid your ionic balance will get disturbed right so we want that these things will go into this filtrate and they will become the part of urine we want from body or from blood these thing will go into the tubules and they will become the part of the urine and this process is known as secretion so make sure you understand the arrows here the things are coming out from the tubules that is reabsorption you are giving back to the blood but from blood you are giving to the tubules is your secretion got it so these three basic steps are the one that helps in the production of urine these three are very much important secretion it is it is usually take place of like ions as i've told you h positive ions potassium ions hco3 negative and other ways okay whereas the reabsorption take place it is of nutrients water basically okay uh, they are uh, basically they are uh, reabsorbed so, okay okay guys so filtrate in uh, filtration process we are forming a filtrate by filtering through the filtration membrane around 1200 ml per minute or that is which is 1 by 5 of the cardiac output comes through the these blood vessels and out of which 180 liter is uh, filtrate is produced per day and from 180 liter 1.5 liter urine is formed then where the one uh, around 99% goes the body has taken it back and this process is reabsorption sometime the harmful substances are given to the tubules through blood this process is known as secretion fine okay moving further the functions of the tubule what does this tubules do so first we'll talk about this pct you as i've told you you have to see where the arrows are going okay so for x for secretion i'll be using this pink color so in pct h positive ions they are secreted and ammonium ions are also secreted again i told you secretion means you are giving back to the tubules so that it will enter into filtrate and it will become the part of urine whereas what are reabsorbed hco3 negative nacl water nutrients and k positive it is said that it is said that around in pct 60 to 70 percent of water is reabsorbed so maximum reabsorption of water takes place in pct do remember maximum reabsorption of water nutrients ions it takes place in pct okay then pct as you can see it is in the cortex this is in the medulla this is medulla this is cortex this is again in the cortex this is in the medulla okay so the ionic concentration will be accordingly so i'm not going towards the ionic concentration first we'll see what the things what the tubes are doing okay now we'll move to the descending loop of, loop of henle descending limb of loop of henle is only permeable to water that it will only help in the reabsorption of water it will not allow any ions to come or go it is impermeable to electrolytes impermeable to ions or electrolytes then we have the ascending limb ascending limb is impermeable to water in this thin limb of ascending as you can see this one is a thick limb this one is a thin limb it has only thin limb it has both thick and thin you can see the diameter yes in thin limb the urea is secreted again i have drawn the pink arrows means secretion okay 
वेयर एज एन ए सी एल इज बोथ रीअब्सॉर्ब इन थिक एंड थिंग टिम्स ओके देन कम डी सी टी इन डी सी टी पोटाशियम आइन एंड हाइड्रोजन आइन्स वॉट आर दे वेर आर दे गोइंग दे आर गोइंग इन साइड वॉट इन साइड योर ट्यूब्यूल्स वेर एज ऑल दीज थ्री दे आर गेटिंग रीअब्सॉर्ब इन डी सी टी इन डी सी टी देर इज कंडीशनल कंडीशनल रीअब्सॉर्बन ऑफ वॉटर दैट मीन्स देर इज अ कंडीशन इफ समथिंग एक्स विल कम ओनली देन दॉटर विल बी रीअब्सॉर्ब फॉर एग्जाम्पल अ हॉर्मोन विल कम हेयर एंड इट इट विल नाउ नाउ द नाउ दिस डी सी टी विल Uh, start reabsorbing water so this is known as conditional reabsorption if that hormone will is not there it will not reabsorb okay so this is known as conditional reabsorption so conditional reabsorption take place in dct out of pct this uh, loop of fenle and uh, dct what do you think the minimum reabsorption takes place you can see the maximum takes place here it is also absorbing a lot of water but the minimum reabsorption takes place in your loop of fenle so if someone ask you If someone asks you, where is the minimum reabsorption takes place? You will say loop of Henle. Okay. Then, then we have here the collecting duct. In collecting duct, as you can see, the urea is reabsorbed and water is also reabsorbed. So this uh, distal con uh, DCT and collecting du uh, duct, they are also helping in formation of so much uh, of your concentrated urine because it is absorbing a lot of water. Okay, so do remember these important points. Like this is impermeable to iron. The sending limb is impermeable to water, but permeable to electrolytes. Fine. So this you need to take care so much because this will help you in understanding a lot of concepts later on. okay so this was about what the functions they do okay so what are they basically doing by secretion of these h positive ions yes ionic balance i hope that you understand as i've told you so here ionic balance is maintained by this pct dct as well as collecting duct so collecting duct also helps in or here also the uh, hydrogen ion secretion takes all right guys okay now let's talk about the some questions conditional reabsorption of na positive and water takes place in pct dct loop of fenle bowman's capsule again i've told you conditional reabsorption whenever the word conditional reabsorption come that means we are talking about dct so answer is two. next the ascending limb is impermeable to salts uh, na positive water all of the above so this was descending limb and this was ascending limb so this one was impermeable to water answer is next so the next topic is counter current mechanism so much awaited i know all of you face a lot of problems in this but it's really simple let's get started so let's talk about the counter current mechanism first of all what does the counter current means counter current means opposite flow what does it means opposite flow So where do we have opposite flow in the kidney? We have opposite flow at two places. One in the loop of Henle, ascending and descending limb of loop of Henle. Yes, we do have opposite flow, and then we have in vasa recta. So opposite flow of loop of Henle and vasa recta plus their proximity. Proximity means that they are present near to each other. helps in generating a mechanism known as counter current mechanism and the sole purpose of this mechanism is to conserve water save water and prevent diuresis what is diuresis loss of excessive water in urine in urine right you face diuresis at some places when you have something like uh, coffee or alcohol when you consume all, consume all these things these leads to diuresis that is they will uh, they will actually do a thing in your body where uh, your 
uh, urine is more diluted. So formation of more uh, dilute urine is known as basically diuresis. So the counter current's main uh, sole purpose is to save water. To make, okay, to make concentrated urine. To make concentrated urine. Okay. So this is the purpose of counter current. And counter current is running because of these two things. Because they have opposite flow. Plus they are present near to each other. Apart from this, two main uh, ingredients. Like every recipe have certain ingredients. Two main ingredients of these are NaCl and urea. These two osmolites, they play a major role in generating this counter current. So let's talk about that in detail. How we are going to conserve water. So to run the counter current mechanism, definitely we need nephron and that nephron is juxtamedullary nephron. As we have discussed during water scarcity condition, the only nephron that work is juxtamedullary. Whereas corticals work under normal conditions. Okay. So here, as you can see here, this is a juxtamedullary nephron. This portion is your cortex. This portion is your upper one is cortex. And lower one is your medulla. Okay. So this entire is medulla. This is cortex. So as you can see, Bowman's capsule, PCT, DCT, all these are in cortex. These things are in the medulla. So now what happens is whenever we have to conserve water, whenever we have to conserve water, the limb starts to work differently. These limbs of vasa rector, they start to function differently. What happens is, if this is a descending limb, this is the ascending limb of loop of Henle. Similarly, we have here the descending limb of uh, your uh, vasa recta and ascending limb of your vasa recta, right? So this is your vasa recta. This is the descending limb of Vasa recta. This is the ascending limb. And this is loop of N limb. Of N limb. Okay. So here, at start, what happens is whenever you have water scarcity condition, the ascending limb of Vasa recta, it starts to give a lot of its NAC. A lot of NACL gets reabsorbed. And enter into these spaces. These are interstitial spaces or interstitium. So this place is interstitium. Okay. So what happened in the start is all the NaCl will start to move outside in the interstitium. Right. Now this vasa recta is present just right here. Like this. Now what will happen because here the blood is entering and blood which is entering here is at around 300 milli osmol per liter osmolarity. Yes. So the cortex osmolarity is 300 milli osmol per liter. What is this? This is that in one liter of solution you will be having 300 milli osmoles of solutes. Okay. So the blood when it is coming out here, the descending limb of vasa recta from where the blood is entering here, it has less osmolarity. And here in the interstitium, because NaCl is so much present now, this NaCl from ascending limb of Vasa recta, it will enter into the descending limb of uh, Vasa recta, right? I think I just said Vasa recta here. The NaCl which has been reabsorbed from the loop of Henle, now it will enter into the descending limb of Vasa recta. Why? Because see guys, it is present just here. If you get confused, I will uh, draw it here because that will make things more easier for you. Let's just do it. Okay, we'll make Vasa recta as it is present here. So this is how the Vasa recta is present here. Okay. Vasa recta is present here. Okay. So this is the descending limb of Vasa recta. This is the ascending. So whenever we have to conserve water, the NaCl from the ascending limb of loop of Henle gets a reabsorbent interstitium. Since this one is at lower osmolarity, the blood is at lower osmolarity. So when it will find NaCl here, the NaCl will start to move towards the descending limb of Vasa recta. Okay, you know that the salts move from high concentration to low concentration, just simple osmolarity. Now, there is so much salt here. There is so much salt entering. There is a formation of gradient. There is a formation of gradient. You will see as the NaCl is entering here, 
down the medulla the osmolarity of blood will start to increase like imagine the nacl is entering here the osmolarity is less but down because the blood is flowing here the osmolarity will increase so much so much so much so much so much so you will see a lot of salt salt at this point a lot of salt is there a lot of salt is there yes a lot of salt is there as a result the osmolarity will start to increase down the medulla both in the loop of Fenlay interstitium as well as in the vasa recta right the osmolarity will start to increase as a result it becomes so much that at this hairpin loop what is known as this is known as hairpin loop the osmolarity will become around 1200 milli osmol per liter okay so this is uh, for both these position the hairpin loop of vasa recta as well as the loop of Fenlay. so do not mislead by because 900 is coming in front of it as it is the shorter one let me just make a longer one so that no confusion should be there okay all right so here the osmolarity is increased so much because there is reabsorption of nacl now as in here the descending one as in here the descending one is reabsorbing water the descending one is reabsorbing water because we know the descending one is only permeable to water it is reabsorbing water when it will see the blood is having a lot of the blood is having a lot of salt you also know wherever there is more salt water will go towards it now the water from here will enter into the ascending limb water from here will enter into the ascending limb and this is we wanted to do we want to take all water from here because if the water from the filtrate goes in these places it will become the part of urine and you want to save water your purpose is to make concentrated urine you don't want to waste water your purpose was to have the water of filtrate now you understand what is a filtrate to have the water of the filtrate so we wanted to shift this water to uh, to the vasa recta to the blood because this is what the blood will go into your entire body so what we did a scheme because this is impermeable to water and this is impermeable to salt that becomes a positive point for us how because whenever there is water scarcity condition the nacl will move out and this nacl will enter into blood now blood is having lot of osmolarity as a result due to having high osmolarity the water from the descending limb of loop of la will enter into the ascending limb of vasa recta and your sole purpose is fulfilled your purpose here was from the filtrate you want blood to go you want the water to go into the blood what was our purpose our purpose was to make concentrated uh, urine so the purpose was filtrates water into blood we want the filtrates water to go into blood okay so this is what we have done first we just move the salt because wherever the salt will go the water will follow right wherever the salt will go the water will follow so what we did we put a scheme here right there is a scheme yes so india works on scheme <laughs> so here nacl moves out in interstitium so the nacl now will go to blood why, why it is going to blood again change in osmolarity it is at higher osmolarity it is at lower from high to low it will move fine so here the osmolarity has uh, has increased so much as a result the water will go to this place because water always move where there is more salt right it always could go to the hypertonic conditions now right so it will move from this descending limb to the ascending limb of water was erected and this is what we always wanted to do so one purpose you got to know that we have um, discussed that nacl has uh, is playing a major role in counter current now you understand what's the role of nacl but what about urea have i ever uh, have i explained anything about urea yet no let's see what is what is its role when it withdraws all its salt when this ascending limb of loop of fenlay has withdrawn all its salt the osmolarity here will decrease got it listen to me very carefully if the loop of fenlay is withdrawing all its salt its osmolarity will decrease as a result this has to stop at some point but we don't want to this to stop at one point or and also we don't want the gradient that is from 300 to 1200 milli osmol will disturb so the urea that is coming from collecting duct will enter here so when if 
when the urea will enter here the osmolarity of loop of nle will be maintained and this is what we want right so that's why we say nsl and urea plays a vital role in counter current for maintaining this gradient where in down the medulla the osmolarity is increases how many times 1 2 3 4 4 time the osmolarity has been increased four time. so all thanks to NACL and urea plus the proximity of vasa recta and loop of nle second the differential permeability of them and third the opposite flow so one more point that you have to know first is their proximity and their differential permeability if any of these thing would not be there the counter current the counter current will not function okay so because they have all these things that's why the counter current is working so well all right i hope that makes sense to you now let's see how can we regulate our kidney function can we make a stop pause or increase or decrease its function yes we can imagine a situation you have lost a lot of body fluid maybe due to diarrhea or something like this or uh, or you have consumed uh, alcohol or something like that. so at that point your body fluid will go down yes and osmolarity in body fluid will increase yes the osmolarity will increase so whenever in a body fluid the osmolarity increases the hypothalamus what is hypothalamus the part of brain this hypothalamus will judge this hypothalamus will judge that the osmolarity has been increased now this hypothalamus will do two things first it will produce a hormone known as adh the full form of adh what is the full form of adh full form of adh is anti diuretic hormone because it prevent it prevents diuresis so you call it as anti diuretic hormone also known as vasopressin the hypothalamus will secrete this hormone and causes its release second the hypothalamus will also promote the thirst because thirst and hunger center are in hypothalamus so here adh or vasopressin now what it will do first of all it will go to dct and collecting duct dct and collecting duct and it will ask these to reabsorb water reabsorption of water okay as a result this will prevent the loss of water in unit urine and hence diuresis so this is how you call it as adh now why we are going it go, uh, why we are uh, asking this or uh, we are saying it as vasopressin vaso means blood vessel and pressin means press constriction so the another name is because it does vasoconstriction when it does vasoconstriction of blood vessels that means there will be increase in blood pressure and hence there will be increase in the glomerular filtration rate okay so it is doing two function one of a vasopressin another preventing diuresis how it is preventing diuresis by telling the dct and collecting duct to reabsorb more water so that in urine less water will be moved out and second it is causing the vasoconstriction that means pressing of blood vessels so that there is increase in gf so this is how the adh function next we have is the ras what is this ras what is this ras have you heard the word ras before yes all right so ras is renin so this renin is of single n double n one uh, was you have done in uh, the double n uh, you have done in the digestion re double n i s right so renin angiotensin aldosterone system so to understand the system and regulation done by the system you need to understand one apparatus which is juxta glomerular apparatus this is bowman's capsule this is afferent arteriol this is efferent okay and here we have dct now you will say ma'am here dct yes because the nephron you always see in the books is an expanded version so when it uh, there are millions of in a kidney so they need to be sitting like this right so as a result if this is a bowman's capsule this is a dct so when you are going to you know collect them up like this or you are going to pack them up the dct will come in close with the bowman's capsule simple yes so here the dct is present here this is a afferent arteriol 
Now the cells of DCT, cells of DCT which are present near to afferent arteriole, they are very thin and densely packed. They are very thin and densely packed. What is this? CT. What is this? This is afferent arteriole, the one which is bringing blood. Now the cells of uh, afferent arteriole which is present near to DCT, they are also specialized. So they have their different names because these are special cells. These cells, these are known as macula densa cells. And these cells, they are known as juxtaglomarular cells. And hence, this apparatus is known as juxtaglomarular apparatus. Juxtaglomarular, right? And hence, this entire apparatus is known as juxtaglomarular. Okay? So, this is known as juxtaglomarular apparatus. So these glomerular cells or juxtaglomerular cells, they secrete renin. What does this secrete? They secrete renin, RNIN. All right, I hope that's pretty clear to everyone. Okay, so now what happens is these are going to regulate your body function. This uh, entire apparatus is going to regulate your, uh, your uh, body function or osmoregulation. So whenever there is decrease in blood pressure, Whenever there is decrease in blood pressure, there will be decrease in blood flow. There will be decrease in blood flow and hence there will be decrease in glomerular filtration rate. So, the regulation will be you have to increase this GFR. Okay. Whenever there is decrease in GFR in your body because there is decrease in blood pressure, there is decrease in blood flow. At that point, there will be decrease in sodium in the filtrate because filtration is being less. This decrease in sodium in the filtrate will be, will be judged by these macular denser cells. So, this macular denser cell will see, oh, the sodium ions are so much less in filtrate. Now, I need to awake. Now, I have to tell to juxtaglomerular cell because juxtaglomerular cell will then will re release the renin. Now, this, is, this will stimulate macular denser cell as I have told you. These macular denser cell, they will stimulate JG cell and JG cell will secrete renin, R-E-N-I. Okay. Now, what does this renin do? That's the main question. Now, what will happen? Now, what will happen? From liver, from liver, a protein is coming. Okay. From liver, a protein is coming known as angiotensinogen. So, angiotensinogen is formed by liver. It goes to the kidney. From where does it come? From liver. So, that's why we say liver performs a vital function in osmoregulation. Okay. So, this angiotensin is converted into angiotensin 1. It is converted into angiotensin 1. By what? By renin. Who is converting it? Renin is converting it. Now, angiotensin 1 is further be converted into angiotensin 2 by another enzyme known as ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, which is formed in lungs. So, from lungs it enters kidney. See, a lot of organs are so much involved here, right? You can see the coordination of our body. So, AC will convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now, this angiotensin 2, what it is going to do? This angiotensin 2, first of all, it will cause vasoconstriction. And due to this vasoconstriction, definitely there will be increase in blood pressure and hence increase in GFR. Okay, why uh, increase in blood pressure causes increase in GFR? Because there will be increase in net filtration pressure. Okay, second thing, it will stimulate 
it will stimulate adrenal cortex you know what is adrenal cortex adrenal cortex is a gland above kidney adrenal gland it secretes a hormone aldosterone now when the aldosterone will come what it will do aldosterone will go to dct and in dct aldosterone will ask dct please do the reabsorption of sodium ions and water and hence we say the conditional reabsorption of sodium ion and water takes place in dct so in dct it will cause reabsorption of sodium ion and water and hence it will it will prevent the loss of water also it ask the pct yes angiotensin 2 will also ask the pct to reabsorb nacl and water so this is how ras is so much important so adh and ras are somehow managing your body to conserve water okay what about the villain now who is the villain anf anf is a villain anf is atria natri uretic factor atria natri uretic factor so like every story has a villain our story also has a villain villain not winner <laughs> sometimes you know slip of tongue so atria natri uretic factor is the another thing that helps in uh, that helps in the uh, regulation so regulation can be both ways okay increase gfr de de decrease gfr increase in water loss decrease in water loss so this atria natri uretic factor it is a peptide secreted by atria of heart atria of heart okay so whenever there is increase in blood pressure the atria will get to know because the blood flows there there will be release of atria as there is release of atria now what will hap happen atria uh, release of anf not atria <laughs> release of anf now what will happen when there is release of anf what will happen this anf this anf will lead to inhibit ras its main function is to inhibit ras second it will cause vasodilation it will cause vasodilation and next it will also inhibit adh because adh and ras they were doing good deed they were conserving your water whereas when vasodilation will occur opposite to vasoconstriction the blood pressure will decrease as a result the gfr will also decrease so this is what your anf see what anf right okay moving further to the next is micturation what is micturation it is the process of release of urine or you also call it as urination okay so micturation is known as urination process of release of urine so for this you need to understand the structure of urinary bladder so this is your urinary bladder and this is the urethra okay so urinary bladder have muscles in it it's highly muscular pear shape organ and here the ureters enter like this and ureters they bring urine from the uh, kidney now you will see ma'am it looks like a monster <laughs> in every class every student say this to me when i was teaching offline everyone used to say this <laughs> even in the live where the chat is there friend used to say ma'am it looks like a monster so here the urine is stored in urinary bladder the urine is stored around 500 ml so the main purpose of urinary bladder is to store urine and here in urinary bladder detrusor muscles are present which muscles detrusor muscles these are the type of smooth muscles which muscles smooth okay this portion this portion is urethra urethra in male and female is different in male it is longer and it is guarded by the rubber band musculum rubber bands you call it as sphincters this is the internal urethral sphincter this is the uh, external urethral sphincter so this is the internal sphincter an internal sphincter in your entire body is made up of smooth muscle and hence it is involuntary an external is made up of 
skeletal muscle and you know skeletal muscles are also known as voluntary muscles so this is under your control so what happen is when there is uh, the capacity of the urinary bladder is to store store urine it stores urine how much urine it can store around 800 ml okay when the when the urine is around 500 ml imagine there is a urine around 500 ml stored in the urinary bladder now what will happen this urinary bladder will stretch this urinary bladder wall will stretch as a result the wall's neuron the stretch receptors neuron will go to spinal cord where it is going it is going to the spinal cord okay right it is going to spinal cord now spinal cord will send its further neurons and it will cause and it will cause the contraction of detrusor muscle so when the detrusor muscle will contract the urine will start to move down and it will cause relaxation of the sphincters because when the sphincters relax the uh, the opening gets wider okay so the sphincters whenever they are contracted it will close the door whenever they are relax it will open the door and hence when these doors are open the urine move out so what happened first the bladder fills around ub means urinary bladder fills up to 500 ml as a result wall will stretch when the wall stretch there is a stimulation to spinal cord and now spinal cord will send the neural signal neural signal for detrusor muscle to contract and sphincter relax and the urine will move out now can you see this is a type of a reflex in reflex is that the same thing occurs whenever you touch a hot plate the sensation go to spinal cord and spinal cord will se send the another signal and the hand will move away this is what happen in your reflex actions right so this is also a kind of reflex you call it as micturation so micturation occurs with the help of a reflex because here the same pathway is going here yes can you see so that's why you also call it as a reflex fine so this was about the micturation let's do some question an adult human ex excretes on an average dash liters of urine per day so how much urine is excreted said by a person around 1 to 1.5 liter as we have done so answer is 2 next on an average dash gram of urea is excreted out per day so how much amount of urea is excreted out per day what do you think what do you think how much amount of urea is excreted around 25 to 30 gram of urea is excreted out per day and how much urea is present in our blood in 100 ml of blood we have around 18 to 30 mg urea per 100 ml of blood in a normal human okay next the gradient across the medulla is mainly caused by nacl urea glucose both one and two you know better now the gradient that 300 to 1200 four time increase in osmolarity down the medulla is due to nacl if you read the question carefully you also have urea so both 1 and 2 answer 4 so what about urine the end product formed is always a urine right so urine is a you know fluid like structure what is its color it's pale yellow in color what's the color of urine pale yellow or transparent it depends upon how much water do you drink it is acidic in nature its ph is around 6 so it's acidic and its uh, ph also depends upon what type of food you eat for example if we eat a lot of vegetables your urine will be towards little alkaline and if you eat a uh, lot of fruits then normal then it will be more acidic but if you eat balanced thing it will be around acidic only okay so what's the composition of urine in urine what we have is still we have 96% water 
that's why it's liquid in state so 96% is water in the urine whereas 2% is urea whereas 2% we have urea so how much urea is excreted per day 25 to 30 milligram urea is excreted per day i think we also have done the question before okay then we have 2% other thing now what are these other things these are other ways like uric acid like creatinine creatinine is a waste which is formed from muscles okay etc so all other ways they get excreted in the urine so let's talk about what if someone's kidney gets damaged what if someone's one kidney get damaged you have seen some people going for dialysis right and if uh, two kidney gets damaged or majority of kidney gets damaged the or you can say the larger part of kidney gets damaged they also ask for the kidney transplant yes so one thing that we have uh, when a person have one kidney another can bear the function of it but the another if it is getting down day by day the person can be asked for dialysis and you call it as artificial kidney and you call it as artificial so what we do in this process if this is the arm of person this is the hand these are the fingers so here at the wrist we have radial artery and we have radial vein this is radial artery this is radial vein this is radial vein and this red one is radial artery so what we do in this kind of a patient we take blood from here we'll take blood from here and we will cool the blood we will take the blood and we will cool the blood at 0 degree celsius and also we will add heparin heparin is anticoagulant so whatever we are doing here is cooling the blood and uh, adding heparin all we want to do is to prevent the blood from clotting the blood has that habit whenever it get exposed to the outside environment or air it will start to clot and we don't want to do that that will lead to other diseases so first of all we are doing these things now we were we are passing blood to a machine known as artificial kidney so now it is going to a machine known as artificial kidney this artificial kidney have a membrane in it known as dialyzing membrane this is a membrane this is this membrane is like a tube hollow tube this membrane is like a hollow tube from here like blood is entering entry of blood this cool blood okay and blood will flow from here and it will do exit here now when the blood is passing through this membrane this membrane is semi permeable this membrane is semi permeable the waste will move out here the waste will move out here okay it is going to move out in this fluid known as dialyzing fluid it is going to move in this fluid known as dialyzing fluid so we have kept the concentration of dialyzing fluid in such a way that the concentration is maintained here here in the dialyzing fluid we put low concentration of waste so that in the blood if the waste is more it will move from high concentration to low concentration fine so the blood has more waste and the fluid has less waste we have kept the fluid in such a way that it will be having low concentration okay and as a result the waste will move from blood to the dialysing fluid from high concentration to low now the blood has been entered from here and it will exit from here now what we will be doing we will be warming the blood and it will and we will also add antiheparin so that heparin will get nullified why because we don't want uh, if somehow when the blood is going back to the body of a person it uh, will not clot when it is required right if a parent is there it will not allow the blood to clot but somehow if this type of a blood will go to a person if a person gets injury it's that blood will get lost and now what we will do we will put the blood back in the radial where we are going to put it okay we are going to put it back into the radial vein so this is how the person's blood gets purified so you pu purify the blood with the help of dialysing uh, dialysis or artificial right okay moving further to the disorders move, moving further to the disorders first disorder is nephritis so you must be thinking uh, nephritis word nephron 
right yes there is inflammation nephron but here the entire kidney gets inflamed so we will better call it as inflammation in kidney so whenever we get inflammation in kidney you call this disease as nephritis okay what is glomerulonephritis when there is inflammation in glomerulus what happen when there is inflammation in glomerulus the filtration membrane will get inflamed and hence its pore size will increase earlier the pores were small and the protein were not able to filter now due to inflammation pore size will increase of filtration membrane now what will happen now the protein that was not filtered now it will also come in the urine and hence proteinuria will occur or albuminuria albumin is a protein that means protein or albumin in urine all right sometimes rbc also occur so we call it as hematuria because now urine will appear red blood or rbc in urine all right next disorders that we have are renal calculi commonly known as renal stone kidney stones so you have heard of these renal stones or kidney stones yes these are the stones which are made up of calcium so calcium oxalate these stones are made up of calcium oxalate mostly and sometime calcium phosphate so mostly they are of calcium oxalate these salts uh, these salts will then form the stones kidney stones and why kidney stones are bad because they will block your renal pelvis your urethra right and causes inflammation and it's really very painful so sometimes uh, with the help of medicines these are removed or sometimes with operations or laser surgeries next we have uremia uremia occurs whenever a person is having a kidney damage for example the kidneys of a person gets damaged now urea will not be excreted and urea will accumulate in the blood and hence there is urea increase in urea in blood and this is known as uremia what do you call it as uremia so in that point we ask person to go for dialysis next disorder that we have okay what's next very important glycosuria ketonuria glycosuria glucosuria is glucose in urine and ketonuria is ketone bodies in urine okay so as we have done it by molecules what have we done in by molecules kids i told you there that everything in our body is in a fixed concentration yes everything is in a steady state in a fixed concentration for example if i say your uh, glucose concentration in blood is around 180 mg of uh, mg per uh, 100 ml of blood or we can say 4.5 millimolar in blood this is what we say what if the glucose concentration gets increased the kidney will throw it out if for example i i have much higher glucose concentration in blood than the normal for longer duration of time the kidney will throw it in the Uh, throw out from the blood in the urine okay now what happen in pace uh, in patients who are diabetics who have diabetes in diabetic patient there is low insulin as a result as a result there is increase in blood sugar whenever there is increase in blood sugar whenever there is increase in blood sugar i told you the kidney will move out the excess glucose in urine as a result you will see in this person's urine a lot amount of sugar okay so there is increase in sugar blood sugar kidney will filter out excess sugar and hence a diabetic person will show the symptom of glucosuria fine The glucose urea is glucose in urine this is a symptom of diabetes second symptom of diabetes is ketonuria because the excess sugar is now moved out from the body 
if a person is normal the person will be having insulin and this sugar will be stored in the liver and become glycogen but now as the person is diabetic there is no insulin the sugar will not become glycogen which is the first source of energy in a person now the diabetic person do not form glycogen what will be the next source for energy how the energy is depleted in our body first of all the carbohydrates are depleted then fats are depleted and then proteins are depleted now when there is no glycogen in a diabetic patient now fat will undergo oxidation when a fat oc undergo oxidation it cannot undergo full oxidation it undergoes partial oxidation and hence it forms ketone bodies and these ketone bodies will pass in urine and hence the situation is ketonuria so glucosuria and ketonuria are two conditions that are seen in diabetic patient as well as in pregnant female as well as in 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 people who are on prolonged fasting on prolonged fasting what happen your glycogen will move out it will be depleted hence you can see glucose in urine and when the glycogen is depleted fat will burn and hence the ketone bodies will be formed so the ketonuria and glucosuria can be seen in diabetic during fasting which fasting prolonged fasting that means for very uh, for a longer duration of time the fasting you take place and in a pregnant female a pregnant okay so this is about the glycosuria or glucosuria and ketone let's do some question guys ready malfunctioning of kidney can lead to accumulation of urea in blood condition called glucosuria is glucose no ketonuria ketone bodies diabetes is different uremia is accumulation of urea in the blood answer is four next stone or insoluble mass of crystallized salts oxalate etc formed within the kidney are seen in very simple renal stones another name of renal stone is renal calcula this is inflammation in the glomerulus uremia is accumulation of urea kidney damage is different thing next amount of co2 excreted out by lungs is co2 how much co2 your lungs excrete yes 200 liter per minute 200 ml per minute 180 liter per day 125 ml per minute now it's a tricky one but very easy tricky one per easy one so we have done that amount of co2 excreted by the lungs is 18 liter per hour okay so it's liter it is written 180 liter per day so you may get confused okay so that's not the option that's incorrect 125 ml per minute or 180 liter per day is your glomerular filtration rate so if someone ask you in minutes you can write this also okay now 200 liter per minute can never happen 200 ml per minute is technically the correct answer so also uh, remember these term in mls in minutes there are different terms uh, or you can say the numbers so you need to understand and remember them okay so 200 ml per minute or 18 liter per hour co2 is excreted next the basal glands secrete or excrete they all hydrocarbon waxes all of these so what are sebaceous gland oil glands oil glands are also the you know uh, secondary excretory organ it uh, excretes waxes even fatty acids these are fats only and even the hydrocarbons so they are all hydrocarbons and waxes all are type of fat so all of these so oil is basically a fat na so it's simple next glycosuria and ketonuria are observed in diabetes insipidus diabetes mellitus uremia both one and two very simple diabetes mellitus is a diabetes that in, involves glucose insulin metabolism whereas insipidus occur due to due to low adh in body as a result there is more diuresis so diabetes have two symptom one excessive thirst and second excessive urination so this two symptoms they are also seen in mellitus as well as in insipidus that's why both are known as diabetes but glucose metabolism is involved in diabetes mellitus so glucosuria and ketonuria is seen in mellitus answer to
नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट इज थैंक यू सो दिस वॉज इट अबाउट एक्सक्रीशन आई होप यू विल स्टडी वेल आई मीट यू विद दी लास्ट चैप्टर दैट्स लेफ्ट न्यूरल कंट्रोल एंड कॉर्डिनेशन टिल देन बाय टेक केयर